Welcome to Dancing in the World, the podcast where we reveal cultural confluences in dance across the globe. My name is Sinclair Imogene. My name is Kate Spanos, and this is our producer, Pablo Hages de Oliveira. So Sinclair and I have written a book called Dancing in the World, Revealing Cultural Confluences, which will be published by Rutledge Press later this year, 2023. And... This podcast is a continuation of the conversations that we've been having over the past four years. We'll talk about the impetus of those conversations a little bit later in this episode. Um, But the book has really been about talking about our experiences in the dance field, specifically in dance academia, as practitioners and scholars coming from particular dance cultures and what it's been like trying to navigate dance academia. And the podcast now is our opportunity to continue the conversations that we've documented in the book. And then with future episodes, we will be inviting in other guests that are bringing in their own perspectives on the issues in the dance field that we see today. Um, but first, let's introduce ourselves, Sinclair. My name is Sinclair Imogene. I'm a dancer, scholar, and choreographer. I am an assistant professor of dance at the Virginia Commonwealth University, VCU. I come from Nigeria, where I got my BA in dance um, from the University of Benin, Benin City, Edo State. Um, After that, I went on to start up my own dance company, WXYZ Art Factory in Benin City. We were commissioned to choreograph the first, one of the first Nigerian dance feature films um, titled I Will Take My Chances, produced by the Royal Arts Academy in Surulere in Lagos. Um, M.M. Isang and Ini Edo were the producers, and Desmond Elliott, the director. After then, I moved to the University of Maryland in Maryland to get my MFA in dance. And since then, I've been practicing as an independent artist before I got the employment at VCU to be an assistant professor. My name is Kate Spanos. I'm from Washington, D.C., which is where we are for filming right now in the Washington, D.C. area. And I'm an Irish dancer and dance researcher. I started Irish dancing when I was a kid. I'm half Irish and half Greek, and my mom, who is the Irish side, took me to an Irish Kaylee or social dance when I was eight years old, and I fell in love with the dance. I continued to dance competitively throughout my younger years of my childhood and my adolescence. And I never really expected to study dance professionally. It was just something that I loved to do. I studied cognitive science at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville as an undergrad. But when I was 25, I knew that there was a program at the University of Limerick in traditional Irish dance. And I went on to pursue a master's degree in traditional Irish dance there. And that really changed the trajectory of things for me. I ended up back in the United States at the University of Maryland in College Park, which is where I met Sinclair when he was doing his MFA. And I did a PhD in theater and performance studies, specifically dance ethnography. And I studied the Caribbean island of Montserrat, which has a really interesting history of Irish and African cultural encounters in their festivals, specifically their St. Patrick's Festival every year and their masquerade dance. And then alongside all of this, I have been practicing Brazilian dance for the past 15 years. I started doing capoeira about 15 years ago, um, almost somewhat randomly. And I ended up doing a Fulbright postdoctoral project in Recife in Brazil to study the carnival dance of Frevo, which we talk about through through the episodes in um, this podcast and also in the book. I'm also the co-founder of Educarte, which is a Maryland-based nonprofit that does arts education, music and dance specifically. We do mostly Brazilian events. We do some Irish events as well. So how did we start this project? We knew each other in graduate school, sort of by face, by name. We had had a couple of, you know, surface level conversations, but it wasn't until, what was it, December 2018. Yes. And... My partner, Pablo, and I, who's also the producer of this podcast, um, were organizing an event at Piola Pizza Restaurant in Arlington, which is no longer there. But um, we did a Brazilian samba event there, and Pablo's band was playing. And I was there just dancing like I usually do. And I remember seeing you out of the corner of my eye. I was like, Sinclair, (laughs) we hadn't seen each other in years. Yes. Well, I have... um 
I have a background in ballroom dancing, uh, uh, Latin dancing especially. Um, so the Latin American international dance category, I would say. Um, and that Saturday, uh, I went to do salsa dancing. And after the salsa dancing, we had dinner. My friends and I were like, where do we go to? And we heard this Brazilian band playing. We're like, ooh, let's go see this Brazilian band. Because, you know, the, the, the sad thing is that when, when ballroom dancers hear samba, we think, you know, international um, European samba. But I didn't know what to expect when I walked in there. It was a traditional samba. And instantly I saw Kate. Um, and I was like, oh my God, Kate. <laughs> <laughs> and so we said, you know, we danced some samba steps together. Um, Kate asked me to show her my samba steps. And I said, well, we could do some whisking action and some <laughs> Botafogo here, you know. And she's like, oh, okay, I don't know. Just, let's just dance. <laughs> So, yeah, that was how we met at the um, pizza party pl place. Yeah. yeah, that's really where the conversation started. And what's funny is that it started as, like, an embodied conversation, you right. know? We, we were just dancing together, and neither of us really belonged in the space, right? right? Like right. me as a, an um, Irish Greek-American in this space, even though I was one of the organizers, I still, you know, it's not my, my culture. And you coming in as Nigerian. Yeah. Um, but we were both able to participate and also cooperate to participate in the event, which was really cool. We were able to use the cultural knowledge that we have from the dance traditions that we already practice to figure it out, you know, yeah. together, which was really cool. Yeah, you know, I was, I really drew on the culture itself, the music, the rhythm. Um, for some reason, I just thought it was really tied to Yoruba culture and my Uroba culture, the way they use the gong, which, you know, we call that go go. And I didn't know the Brazilians actually call that a go go as well. Yeah. So it was just kind of this unique, um, uh, kind of intercultural, cross cultural um, uh, connections, you know, putting that together. I just felt really tied to it and listening to the music and seeing how people were in the space eating, having social. Um, chatting dialogues it was it's just unique and i said this feels like nigeria you know so that just made us get into this conversation and start recounting incidents yeah i know that was a major compliment to pablo to hear that his music his event reminded you of nigeria um and there are so many documented connections you know between the african culture and afro-brazilian culture um but but yeah, it was just such a fun event. And I think having known each other from the academic dance world, we both we both knew that like you knew that I did Irish dancing and I knew that you were from Nigeria and that also you did ballroom dance. Right. <laughs> um, but it was kind of like we ended up having a conversation about a week later. You called me and Pablo to <laughs> yes. say, hey, we need to do more of this. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we had realized before how we had both had these experiences of cultural cooperation and cultural collisions, yeah. right? When the worlds collide and like, how do we figure out the, how to behave, yeah. how to dance in these events? Very out of necessity, right? Because I was um, newly migrating into the, um, kind of assimilating into the DC dance scene. And I was obviously feeling like an immigrant, right? And seeing this type of, communities, you know, kind of silo communities on the fringes uh, made me feel, oh yeah, I could connect with these people. And that was why it really called because I wanted to have more of that event. Um, I was already doing salsa. I was already doing the country line dancing group thing. Um, but I was doing ballroom on the side as well. So really looking for communities um, instantly called. And I think our conversation just um, kind of sparked um, this new ideas we have for writing a book. I think at the root of it, it was about, you know, how do we engage with cultures outside of our own? And also, how do we bring our own cultural traditions and our own embodied cultural knowledge into spaces that might be m unfamiliar? So through these various migrations. So, for example, you coming from Nigeria to the U.S. is, is a very clear migration, immigration, right? And for me, um, it's a little bit... Um, vaguer in a sense, but being 
Irish American being Greek American, feeling a really strong pull to those heritages and also as an Irish dancer, actively engaging throughout my whole life in a form that is meant to be representative of the Irish experience and specifically the Irish diasporic experience is all about migration, yes. you know, and all about how we navigate the world of trying to engage in cultures outside of their communities of origin in new spaces yeah. like that. Yeah, and I think both of us being so, you know, into academia and really looking at research more broadly, we found this idea of cultures coming together really fascinating. We felt some certain type of freedom that this gave us as independent artists, but also artists who were working from different cultural aesthetics. And so it, Kate and I just went into this kind of rabbit hole of saying, well, why have we not felt this way in our academic um, research and participating in um, higher education dance in America? What is it that is like so different and some, somewhat sterile, if we will, in, in the ways that we are presented into the space and the way we experience the spaces. And so we're like, maybe uh, we could talk about this more. And I think for two years, we just went on and on talking about what this was for us and how we can create uh, different types of communities for ourselves. Um, writing an article was what we started thinking about um, because, you know, as academics, that's kind of the first thing we think of, right, an article. Um, but then when we went into the conversation, we thought we had so much more to say uh, that couldn't be contained in one article. So we wrote a book and now we're still talking. <laughs> <laughs> but it really started with a lot of frustration yeah. in a lot of ways. We both experienced a lot of frustration, both here in the U.S. and also outside of the U.S., you know, just in many experiences in our lives, just feeling like, oh, we're not being understood or we don't feel like we belong or we're not being accepted. And it was, I think, surprising for both of us to find that both of us had a shared understanding of what was going on in the dance field, even though we come from such different backgrounds. Um, and I think that's what is unique. That's sort of our selling point, right? That we're, we've done this collaboration across cultures, across races, across nationalities, ethnicities, all of that sort of thing. Um, and we've come to a place where I think we're less frustrated now, right? Because right. We, we've gotten so much of it out and we're able to talk about it in a sense that's a little bit more, less defensive and more like solution driven, really. Like, what is the value that we see in the cultural dances, the dance cultures that we come from, and how can we we express that to people that are from outside? Yeah, at, at the basic level, we found a problem and we found solution. But I think we found more than a solution. That's why we're excited about this work that we're doing. We found that we can not only prefer solutions, but we can be the solution. And using our artworks and our dance works and our scholastic work, um, we can create space for ourselves and people in our communities. I know that when we started talking, um, another colleague of, of mine had asked, well, can you envision what equity or inclusion mm. would look like in terms of the issues that you're talking about? And I said, no, I, I can't imagine it. And now that we've gone through this process of writing the book and we're continuing to have these conversations, I actually can see it, right. which is not a solution per se, mm -hmm. but it's certainly getting towards something. Yeah, it's a process. So yeah. solution isn't like a one stop. Right. We fixed it, but it's going to be continuous. Right. Yeah. So I think we'll take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to invite Pablo, our producer, back with us and he's going to ask us some rapid fire questions about what even do we think dance is because we sort of need to start with those definitions so we'll be back with that in a moment So why don't you each tell us about what was your first dance experience? Yeah. Go ahead, Sinclair. Uh, well, my first dance experience performing would be at my dad's funeral. 
I was probably 18, 19, um, 18, 19 years old, and, you know, the burial was a sad ceremony, but they played music, and for the first time, I was there really out of emotions. I was dancing a lot, and that was the first time I danced in front of people, and that felt really satisfying, but very remarkable, yeah. How old were you? I was probably 18, 19, I think. Yeah. And have you danced before that too in other settings? Not Would performing? Would be in like dancing in the living room without anyone watching, <laughs> you know, but like never danced in front of people. Like mm -hmm. that was something I never did ever. Like, yeah, no. Yeah. <laughs> dancing. I was so shy as a kid. So dancing was out of it. Yeah. yeah. I was also painfully shy yeah. as a kid. I think that's why we get along. Um, and it wasn't until I started dancing that I started to find a voice per se, yeah. you know, I was actually able to express myself in a way that felt good. I never talked. So Same actually dear. we had a family <laughs> friend once say to me, oh, oh, she talks with her feet. Oh. Okay. Like now we get it. Um, but my earliest memory of dancing is, is really dancing with my mom. I mentioned at the beginning that she took me to my first Irish Cayley social dance. But even before that, she had taught me the basics of Irish dance in the kitchen because she was not an Irish dancer. She just knew those basics, the threes and the sevens. And she taught it to me. And I had so much fun hopping around in the kitchen. And I also just danced around the living room, turned on music, and had a great time. And I also remember my yaya, my Greek grandmother, teaching me the basics of Greek dance in her kitchen. So a lot of my earliest memories are of just dancing in kitchens with family members, and it just brought me a lot of joy. And when I started Kaylee dancing, it was just such a rush. It was chaotic, but also so structured. And I just remember really feeling thirsty to get it. Mm -hmm to figure it out. Mm -hmm. And when I started, um, when I started lessons, I really, I really took to it. There was never a time that I didn't want to go. Like I never wanted to go to soccer practice, basketball, right. what, I was the worst <laughs> at sports, but n I never didn't want to go to dance class. Oh. And even competing, it wasn't about competition. I loved performing. And what would you classify as dance? Well, dance, in my head that the fundamental idea is to move to a particular rhythm. Either you're happy, sad, or showing, expressing different types of emotions. So that's the definition of dance, and that is how I try to tie it to my culture, right? Um, I think dance is something that um, every human does. Um, I, it's, dance is not necessarily a structured way of moving, but for me, it's contained in our attitudes. You know, those moments where you see a black person with their group laughing and falling down, you know, that is a dance. It's a dance of joy. When you see an African who has experienced a sad news putting their hands up on their head, that is a posture of dance that expresses a, a type of movement. Because, and why I say this is that Without saying that you're happy from afar, you see someone laughing in that posture, you know that that person is happy, and that is moving you. That is a dance, you know. Um, if you see someone go in a sad post posture from afar, you see them, you know that they're sad. That is passing an embodied message to you. You feel it. They don't have to use words. And dance presents itself in ways that um, is just in us, yeah? Um, and not to minimize the extensive training that we as professionals do have as dancers, but at the very, very granular level, dance is that. It's just those little actions that in themselves just expresses ideas. Yeah, I agree that at its core, dance is expressive movement of any type, and I know that Dance anthropologists over the decades have said that, you know, dance is something that is more structured, right? That there is some kind of, I don't know, some, you see the reflection of society in the dance and things like that. And, and 
I absolutely think that's the case in some dances, but I also think that, like you're saying, there's something that we can't even quite express right now about dance because of the way that it makes us feel. There's a joy, there's sometimes a sadness. I know that when I dance at home alone, I still you know, practice my steps, my Irish dance steps all the time. And sometimes I just turn on a song and one that's really traditional, really like, just really gets me. And I get tears in my eyes and I don't even realize that maybe I had a hard day or maybe it wasn't even so hard, but I just feel something and I didn't even know it was there. So it's for us to be able to express something, but also for our bodies to tell us how we're feeling in certain ways. And for me, it's highly personal in that way, but also extremely social. Because even if I'm dancing alone, I feel as somebody that comes from a specific dance culture that I'm engaging with a community of dancers today and in the past, and in the future for that matter, that all share an understanding of how our bodies work and how we interact with each other. Yeah. Well, <laughs> those are great explanations. Um, what do you think that other people think when they hear the term dance? There are symbols that has been like that have been established in our minds to think of products. Dance is a product. It's like when you think about Christmas, yeah, you think Christmas tree, you think snow, you think what uh, Santa Claus, Santa. right? <laughs> <laughs> if you are. Um, more like a uh, traditional Christmas person, you would think about the gingerbread and all that other that uh -huh. stuff, right? Um, we know that people in Africa celebrate Christmas. Not all of them have Christmas trees, right? Mm -hmm. Snow that certainly does not fall. <laughs> <laughs> so, so when I think dance, the way dance has been marketed across the globe is this picture of a ballet dancer. Um, you know, with a nice, probably an attitude pose and a uh, nice, beautiful tutu, white, pink colors and um, or a, a silhouette of a, 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 a girl, a female, or a male, um, a female standing on the pointed toes, right? So that is kind of what dance, what I think people, when you say dance, People think that, right? And if if we go more on a broad scale, like you know, expanding the Christmas analogy, <laughs> people may think, oh yeah, okay, ballroom dance, right? Or um, flamenco, or one of the European ways of dancing, um, or you know, we could think sexualizing African butt shaking dance as dance. Um, or, you know, on the more licentious side, we could think strip club, right? Dance. Um, so that's what I think when people think that. <laughs> really, it's funny, but yeah, that's what I think when people think dance, yeah. Yeah, related to that, I think there's a lot of ideals about the body that come yeah. through dance. So either the, the Western ideal of the ballet dancer with the tutu and the pointed feet and the extensions, or the the sexualized body, right. right? I think historically dance has been, the body yeah. in general has been kind of, there's been suspicion of anything having to do with the body. I know that, you know, theater has dealt with that as well, just the idea of somebody right. getting on stage and putting themselves out there. Um, and, you know, I think when I ask my students, I, I teach a class in dance ethnography, research and dance and culture, and they all think they're coming in to study just one style of dance, which is not necessarily just ballet, but any dance that's on stage. Mm -hmm. And something that you have to train your whole life for and that you have to be super flexible to do. And they see that as real dance. Mm -hmm. And even if they see other dances as also dance, it's not real. And they use that word, real, which I find really interesting and, you know, I address that immediately because there are those of us that train our whole lives in other styles that are very different. And there are other dancers that don't train in the same way, right? But they still take their dances just as seriously. Yeah, I mean, there's a canvas of defining dance. Virtuosity is one. Mm -hmm. Challenging is another. 
you know, beautiful is another. Yeah. So yeah, we often hear a lot of these types of um, description of dance. So yeah, that's what we think when we think that other people, what, what do they think when they hear dance? <laughs> that's what I think they're thinking. <laughs> yeah. By the way, this is just an assumption. <laughs> <laughs> But based on experience, you know, right, we right, both right. teach students and we Correct. they come in with, with these assumptions. And right. so they're coming in and they're just, you know, they're either, they've been dancing their whole lives mm -hmm. in one, usually in, in one form. If they're in the yeah. university, for the most part, the universities are offering primarily yeah. modern or, or ballet based training. At least in the U.S., I think. In the U.S., yeah. And um, they may have other types of training, but I've had students come to me who are, you know, classical Indian dancers or hip hop dancers, and they tell me, "Well, I'm going to start taking ballet because that's the foundation of all dance." <laughs> right. And that's another one where you just got to address it right away. Yeah. And I think that that's a lot of the assumptions that we're dealing with when we have these conversations. I, you know, we're we're dealing with the fact that. People have categorized dancers and people based on visible markers that are related to race, culture, gender, class, all of these things. Um, but that confluences, you know, this idea of all of us coming together and engaging with each other despite these different identities um, is what we're really interested yeah. in the book. Who is this book and this podcast for? <laughs> Well, for me, this book is for dance practitioners, especially those who are trying to diversify their own ideas of what dance is, um, and people who want to offer spaces, equitable spaces for other people. Um, it helps, I think it will help people see struggles that they wouldn't normally see, either because they're not able to voice their opinions, because they're you know, they would get um, a some sort of retaliation against them um, or um, they simply do not have the language to describe what they're doing, right? And I think this book, um, in my head, does um, offer people a way to talk about this sort of traditional or non-mainstream forms that they, they practice. Yeah, I think a lot of the work we've done is in part trying to demonstrate a collaborative model that has worked for us, yes. which we talk about throughout the book and the podcast, and also along with Pablo being one of our collaborators, um, and how to open up these conversations. And I think one of the frustrations that I've had has been that the conversations around diversity and inclusion in the dance field have felt very surface level, and that we can't really get into the nuances of what our experiences have been, and we're relatively young in the yes. field. Um, we're very young <laughs> in the field. Yeah. And, um, you know, we're just getting started. And I, I think that we're looking at our mentors, the people that have come before us, and the work that they've done to get the field to a certain place. And we're seeing the role that we can play. Yeah. And as I said before, I think that before this process, I couldn't envision what it would look like, and now I have a clearer idea of at least how to get us to the next stage of training young students to be able to recognize, you know, where we can have more conversations about diversity um, and equity as well, and also people that are already in the field. And they may be practitioners, they may be scholars and researchers, they may be funders, they may be programmers, curators. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of people could benefit from hearing from people like us, and not just us, but also the others that we bring into this conversation. Yeah, absolutely. I, I just wanted to add that working together as, you know, a black male and a white female, um, that, that type of collaboration was kind of far <laughs> kind of something that was um, unattainable, right, in terms of looking at how, how would we work together. Um, but I think one thing that really helped us was leaving the narrative that's out there and saying what is actually happening with us, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Stepping away from saying, oh, I'm a black man in America, blah, 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 but coming to say, Sinclair, who are you? What's, what, what are you experiencing as Sinclair? Mm -hmm. And Kate, you know, a white woman, what are you experiencing as... Um, and that, that really just opened a whole world 
of possibilities of things we can talk about. Yeah. Um, not all of us fit into the narrative, right? Not that we don't want to fit into the narrative or saying that we don't want to take responsibility of um, our contributions in this world, but saying that if we recognize such nuances, right, um, at that very basic level, we have so much more to say and so much more to accomplish. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and what you'll see in the book, hopefully you will buy the book, read the book, is a lot of personal anecdotes. Yes. We've written very collaboratively, so there's a lot that is just completely <laughs> both of us, you know, molding it and shaping it, but also um, what we call interludes, yes. where each of us talk about, you know, our memories yeah. um, over the years, some very early memories and some more recent um, relating to these issues. Yeah. And, and I was going to say that we we came to this conversation really not contrived at all. We walked through embodied practice. We produced, um, literally produced an evening length event. We danced together. We've been practicing as dancers in the field. We've been teaching classes, right? We've been in the forefront of these conversations. We are out there um, doing this work. And so most of the things that we have written and have talked about came out of this type of experiences, you know, we, we, we get feedbacks, we get criticism, we get critique from people in the field and we are putting it out there saying this is what we are hearing, this is mm -hmm. what we are shaping, this is the, these are the ideas that are coming out of this kind of works that we're doing and um, yeah, that's why every time we talk we have so much more to talk about <laughs> <laughs> and I think we're still going. It's very generative. Yeah, yeah very, yeah. very. Yeah. <laughs> So the future episodes that we'll be touching on um, include defining what we mean by cultural confluences. That'll be the next episode where we really define this term and how we're thinking about it. We also have an episode where we bring Pablo in to talk about the creative collaboration that the three of us worked on that yes. came straight out of the Samba party and <laughs> came before the book and ended up kind of being performed while we were writing. Um, and other topics around choreography and improvisation, aesthetic value, what is good or bad in dance, um, and a variety of other topics. And, you know, as we continue the podcast, we'll be including all the topics that we didn't get to fit into the book. So, Yes, we do not think that this is a solution to all, but we want to invite other people after this um, series of the first podcast. We are opening the doors for other people to come in and join us in the conversations. Yeah, we don't want to just write the book, close it, and say we're the experts and we're done. Right. We're opening up a conversation. We want to thank our funders, the Maryland State Arts Council and the Virginia Commonwealth University School of the Arts for funding us and supporting us throughout this journey.